joining us. One of my favorite topics is coffee. My guest is Jose Rene Martinez, owner of J. Rene Coffee Roasters. Welcome. Thank you so much for the invitation. And your coffee in front of you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So you grow up in Connecticut? Actually, I'm a product of the South Bronx, New York City, and I also lived in Puerto Rico. All right. So we're lucky to have you then. Thank you. So um, how did you get into roasting coffee? How, tell, I want the long story. <laughs> I would, the best way to describe it, it was a very incidental experience. I actually went uh, shopping for wallpaper. I, How old were you when you did uh, this? This was about 13, 14 years ago. Okay. And so we're looking for wallpaper. Looking for wallpaper with a friend, and it just so happens that there was another vendor who had a coffee roaster engaged in conversation, found myself, it piqued my interest, and I decided, I think I want to buy that and I made him an offer it just so happens that he was willing to sell it and within about three weeks I find myself buying coffee equipment that I didn't know how to use so are were you a big coffee drinker absolutely and I think that's how a lot of great passions start is you know you find yourself enjoying something that you love you want to learn more about it what I quickly learned was that coffee was deceptively complex it involved a lot of science, a lot of labor, it was incredibly artisanal, and it was something that I just simply embraced from the very beginning. So where did you start roasting coffee? So you, so you got all this equipment. I had all this equipment. Now what happens? I found myself opening, I, had a, I, was, I worked full time, so I only opened one day a week for the first five years on a Saturday from 10 to 3 but what I found was I never missed it I never missed a Saturday it was just so much fun and it was in a space not much bigger than a bedroom and I did that for five years until we started growing my skills started uh, expanding my passion for it started growing and then I bought so much equipment I had to do something with it so we decided to open up a store that would open seven days a week. And that's in West Hartford. And that's in West Hartford. Which, okay, so let's start looking at some pictures so we can help tell your story a little bit. These are sure. the kinds of coffees that you have, and we have some more on the table here. We'll just go through the two sure. more shots of these. Um, and ending up here on the next one, this is a give back coffee. Sure. Yes, tell yes. me about this. So sure. it wasn't good enough for you just to roast coffee, you had to give back because that's who you are. And I appreciate the. Uh, I appreciate that uh, statement. What happens with anything in life is as you become proficient in something, you feel like you've amassed certain experiences and you feel that there's a message that, that follows after that. Our growth in coffee and our growth in specialty grade coffee made it possible for us to create ways to not only give back to a lot of the farmers and a lot of the people that we were buying coffee from, but to also use this as an educational tool um, to help those underrepresented. So I have, I've always enjoyed sports and I enjoy the sport of cycling. And I was watching a movie called Rising from the Ashes while I was training on my stationary bike. And it was a story of how the Rwandan team, national cycling team was created post-genocide. I was literally in tears and I had it this, I, I was so, I wanted to use coffee because one of the things that I learned was that coffee was transported in a lot of these regions by bicycle. I drafted an email, mm -hmm. I sent it to the star of the, of the show, he responded back and I came up with this idea of creating a coffee that would give back that came, uh, that was the birth of Victus Coffee. And why Victus? Victus was using Latin words about lifestyle, about improving your quality of life. And what I decided to do was to create a program that uh, gave, gave uh, resources back to nonprofit organizations that promoted wellness, social advocacy, and empowerment through endurance sports. So one of the things that I realized is that by doing this, we found ourselves channeling this great product to so many individuals that loved coffee, wanted to learn about coffee, 
it did matter the age group because if they weren't drinking coffee, they were fascinated by the logo or they were fascinated by the work that we were doing and the sponsorships of the groups that we were supporting. Let's go back to the pictures now. And we have um, a shot of you at a cupping event. Is That's that what correct. this is? <laughs> now, this is in, where is this, Indonesia? Yes, this was taken in Indonesia. And if you notice, it's, we're having this sensory analysis on top of a ping pong table. And Why not? <laughs> And what's really fascinating, and it's also humbling, is the life of a farmer, uh, their quality of life, uh, they, lived, they live in very difficult circumstances. So we play a big responsibility in educating consumers about coffee, making every effort possible to uh, take uh, our uh, proceeds uh, or a percentage of what we make and give back. We're not just buying a product, but a lot of like the ethos behind what I try to do in coffee is to, sell, is to provide a coffee that has a story. And I make that story very intimate. Does this go back to your childhood, the need to give back? It does. It does. My father was a farmer, a factory worker. My mom was uh, has, and is still currently at the age of 33 a teacher. She's been a teacher all her life. And those are, I think, values that I think have always been very important to me. Mm -hmm. And I think that I can make that possible through the our coffee story. Now, you've traveled the world, you've done your cupping events, you you know beans. How did you decide on the certain types of coffees that you picked? Was that difficult? Uh, that's a good question. We, coffees, you can, uh, coffees come from Africa, Indonesia, Central South America, and are, are like the largest producing coffee regions. And what I found is that based on the topography, uh, of uh, where that coffee is found, it developed different flavors. Sure. Seventy percent of your flavor experience is olfactory, either ortho or retronasal. It's not gustatory. So smell Listen is huge. Listen to with the big words. I know. I learned that. And then we're all different, right? Because <laughs> I'm different from you, and what, what coffee I like is maybe different from what. So, so you narrowed it down to how many varieties you've got. Uh, six or three? Uh, we actually, we can, our coffees, we get coffees from different parts of the world. What we choose to represent is a small amount. Once that uh, particular coffee is uh, sold, we get new coffees from different regions. I see. This particular brand, our Victus brand, it's, these are blends. So we predominantly sell these as light, medium, and dark. For those who like a bolder flavor, for those, uh, the medium is more for people who enjoy espresso-based drinks, and lighter because, believe it or not, your most aromatic intensity is light roasted coffee. Really? So when I order, like, a blonde, and I think it's just so light, it's not really. There's stuff yeah. going on. Absolutely. So you're teaching me. Oh, uh, we're that's all That's very learning. good. All right, let's look <laughs> at your place in West Hartford. Thank you. Um, which is very cool. How old is it? That we've had that in uh, 320 Park Road for the past seven years. All right, and you're still learning about roasting, right? Every it's time you you go into continual this. Continual process. Oh, what is this? That's a siphon pot, and what's really great and what I enjoy about coffee is I know the West Coast and a lot of other regions get all the all the credit for pushing uh, of the specialty coffee movement, but believe it or not, those are siphon pots, and those are manufactured by the Hartford Silex Company up until roughly the 1960s. Really? That is an artisanal brew method that is incredibly popular in Asian countries. They actually have world competitions for it and what you have is a two-chamber process where water rises from uh, the bottom chamber to the top it gets infused with the coffee for a minute 30 seconds and then when you remove it from the heat source it creates a vacuum the coffee comes down there's a filter in between which was patented by a West Hartford resident back in 1924 yes okay and it produces a coffee that accentuates the subtle aromatic uh, notes uh, that uh, you can uh, perceive through coffee um, using that brew method. So are these antiques that you're using? No, they're, they are currently still being produced. Uh, different companies produce them, and it's our way of showcasing an artisanal brew method, but also a little bit of history because uh, coffee, there's a lot of coffee history in Connecticut. Like, give me some more. Sure, William B. Boardman was a gentleman who was producing coffee in the mid 1800s, and I actually have the uh, the switch panel that powered two circa 1910 Molitor roasters in my store, which I found in an abandoned building in Hartford. 
Wow, so you're, you're, you really are passionate about this. I tend to believe in life that to understand present day perspectives, you also have to look back at history. In order to understand where we are now, we have to see that connection. And oftentimes I think it's our responsibility to say, while well, this is fun and this seems cool, there were many people that labored for over 100 years to bring this product to the service to where it is now. Now we have a picture of a really pretty cup of coffee. I only wish I could do this. <laughs> so every time you get a, cof uh, a coffee there, do you, you guys do this? Absolutely. That's an, esp that's an espresso-based uh, drink. So we offer milk-based drinks like lattes and cappuccinos, but we also offer coffees where oftentimes people just enjoy their coffee black. Now, it's not good enough that you have a place in West Hartford. You've got little... Um, retro coffee units. This one is at Clinton Crossing. That's correct. And then you have another one at the Science Center. That's the next picture, which is orange, I believe. Where did you find these? And, and this speaks to my heart because I love vintage. Well, it's thank you so much. Uh, first recommendation is stay away from Pinterest because every time you find yourself with crazy ideas and I wanted to create something no pun intended, that was mobile, that would allow us to share the story that we believed was a great story, but in a way that allowed us to continue that entrepreneurial spirit without overextending ourselves financially. And what we realized that I came up with this idea because I started looking at, at, at um, Airstream uh, uh, trailers and I saw a picture of a, of a horse trailer and I literally went on Craigslist Con saw a trailer that I liked and had it completely modified and I realized, wow, we could do this. And it started growing. Thanks to the vision of uh, the people at Clinton Crossings and uh, Sherry at the Connecticut Science Center, they gave us an opportunity to say, hey, listen, we would love to showcase uh, your coffee trailers, and that has started to grow, and we're hoping to maybe build a, a third or a fourth one. Now, what if somebody comes to you and says, I love that so much, I, I want to operate one. Would you franchise these, or, how, or have you not thought that far yet? Yes, there's always that opportunity. Our big concern is we don't want volume. We don't want to sacrifice quality and our ethos and what we believe in just for the sake of adding more but we do believe that our story is a great story to be told there are a lot of people that labor long and hard to make a uh, jerry what it is it's not just uh my efforts alone and i've been really blessed to do what i've been doing so we i work more and i prefer to focus on the relationship building than i am about just ex creating more and more units but we do believe that um there's a lot of opportunity, and we're always receptive to uh, extending that story to more towns. Well, I love this. I think there should be a one at every train station <laughs> in the state of Connecticut. Um, you also have music at your place we in do. West Hartford. So that's more of, let's bring the young artists in, the local artists. Let's, it's, it's a community house is what you built, right? Yes. I see J. Renee Coffee Roasters as an artisanal gathering place where the social experience is equally as important as the coffee that we serve. We don't provide Wi-Fi for a particular reason, not because we don't believe in technology, but what I've found that despite all the technology that we had, we were, and all the connections that we had virtually, we were still disconnected socially. So our tables are long, it enables you to say hi to the person next to you, and some amazing relationships, friendships, Business opportunities have been born through that experience of saying, hey, Jen, I want you to meet Matt. Wait, you're having conversations? Absolutely. Actual conversations. It's, and it gets loud. Is there any pushback <laughs> from the young people about, hey, I need to be on my phone and checking stuff? Or, or is it actually nice for them because they don't have to be on the phone because they can't? There's no Wi-Fi. That's a good question. I am a big believer that coffee shops are evolving. They're not the stereotypical you know, you get, uh, you sit, and it's a, it's a, a workstation. Coffee shops are like, they're no different than restaurants. They have their own theme, they have their own message. If this particular shop isn't what you're looking for, there's some great shops elsewhere. So I think what's happening is that people see our shop as just another different coffee experience. Mm -hmm. 
What was the hardest thing about getting this business going? And as an entrepreneur and, and just starting out and throwing a coffee roaster at the wall, so to speak, and you made it, what, what was the hard part? Uh, it's pretty simple. I think that oftentimes when you have a passion for something, you don't necessarily have all the tool sets that are needed to make a business successful. The concept may be great, but it's kind of like I've always said, you may be a great attorney. That doesn't mean that you can successfully run a law practice. There's the business aspect of it, and there is the advocacy part of it. Business, these uh, ideas are no different, where we had a great idea, but we learned, we were learning literally day to day. I remember the first day that we opened, and there were people out the door, and we literally forgot our petty cash. We had no money in the register. And we had to borrow from our employees and for customers because we were simply that, um, despite the fact that we were so prepared, we were not. Those are the kind of funny challenges, but the reality is that in order to grow a business, you have to have a certain degree of business acumen. And I think that the more we elicit the help and assistance, not only from friends and subject matter experts, but it's also apropos to find state agencies to extend that helping hand, which is so important for us, so that we're not always financing our dreams at levels that are unsustainable. Best thing about what you did 13 or 14 years ago by buying that coffee roaster? Uh, was my ability to give back. By doing that, I have partnered with some amazing organizations. I'm currently um, uh, exploring the opportunity and finalizing an opportunity to work with another nonprofit. Uh, Center of Latino Progress is, has this organization called Bicico, which is an organization that promotes youth cycling in Hartford, and our Victus brand is going to be part of their bike cafe. It's my ability to listen to so many stories. And what people don't realize, my story is not as interesting as the stories of so many people that come to our shop on a daily basis and have an amazing story to share. And we feel that this venue makes it possible for those stories to be heard. Are you up like 48 hours in a row? I mean, I know there's only 24 <laughs> hours in a day, but you're, you speak so passionately about what you have built. Do you envision a, another place outside of West Hartford? Or you're not really interested in volume, but do you see this as a template to put one maybe in New Haven or New Britain or wherever? It is. We do believe that this model is one that has uh, incredible reach. I'm incredibly excited about the Victus program because I think it has global reach. One of the partners, another partner that we uh, uh, had uh, for two years was we sponsored uh, the Rwandan national cycling team. What our belief is that we can definitely increase our reach, but I think the most important thing is to develop a coffee that people resonate, that they enjoy, that it has a story, that it just isn't just volume based. And we like that level of quality, we like that level of attention, and it's something that I've been able to create and see it grow on my terms, and that's been a big blessing. And amen to that. I want to thank you, Jose Rene Martinez, owner of J. Rene Coffee Roasters, and I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you so much. Thank you. Spend all night kissing and a bump is right here, then who else is missing? Got a little sidetracked to find my solution. I find a piece of the door, but it's also a metaphor. Need to keep locked in the grocery store of my mind. Just the same time, skip right ahead to the nice ride.